but tonight I'm here to talk to you about uh, salamanders and we'll get right into it. I hope. Starts with a video, the video starts dark. There we go. So what you're viewing now is a breeding aggregation of uh, spotted salamanders. This will be happening in approximately two weeks from today. Don't care what the weather's like, it's gonna happen towards the end of uh, March and then into the first couple of weeks of uh, April. If you look on the center of the screen, there's a male that is about to deposit a spermatophore. So I was gonna pause, but I don't know if I'll get back into it if I pause. So there he is, he's hanging on with his back legs, about to lift off, there's the spermatophore. So this is primarily an aggregation of male spotted salamanders, but you can bet, am I okay standing here? Should I be behind here? Um, so you, but you can bet that there's a male, there's a female or two in there. So the presence of a female will stimulate this vigorous activity. And if uh, you go to a really productive pond, you can get masses of salamanders in the hundreds. There's one particular pond that I go to in uh, North Halton. Um, and I would say that there's upwards of five or 600 salamanders sometimes in these uh, aggregations. Uh, a really exciting time of year. It is something at this time of year, the first thing that I do in the morning is go on my computer and find out what the weather forecast is because it could happen any time now. Um, so it's something very much to look forward to if you're into salamanders, reptiles in the very near future. What you want ideally is a, a day that is above 10 degrees, um, staying relatively mild in the night and rain. If you get rain and uh, the temperatures are uh, around 10, 12, 13, 15 degrees during the day, at the end of March through to the uh, middle of April, that is absolute prime condition for uh, spotted salamander migration to the pond and, and activity. Uh, having said that, once they get to the pond, uh, there will always be activity night after night after night for approximately three weeks again into uh, about mid-April. Um, it just won't be as vigorous if it's a cold night. You could even go out when the temperature, the air temperature is below zero, minus two, minus three. If the salamanders are in the pond, you'll see some activity. Uh, so a few terms to acquaint yourselves with, and uh, my apologies to people in the audience who are already well familiar with these terms, and I, I know Bill is. Um, spotted salamanders are in the Ambistoma genus of salamanders. Uh, there's about 34 species or so in Eastern North America or throughout North America. Here in the Hamilton area, here in South Central Ontario, we have three. Uh, the spotted salamanders, the uh, ones that I've just been discussing, the blue spotted salamander, um, and there's blue spotted salamander right there, quite a bit smaller than the spotted salamander. And uh, Bill referenced uh, in his introductory remarks, the Jefferson salamander. The Jefferson salamander uh, is a complex creature though, and I'll explain a little bit about that um, as the presentation goes on. So they're ambistoma. Uh, they all have lungs. They all uh, have similar habits. Uh, a colloquial name for ambisoma salamanders is mole salamanders. And that's a very ap uh, apropos name for them because they spend most of the year underneath the ground. Uh, in the spring, of course, they rise to the surface. There's this ma mass migration to the pond. Uh, in the fall, they'll reappear above ground uh, on suitable bays when it's nice and moist, uh, but it, not in the numbers that they do in the springtime. 
vernal pools are worthy of discussion. And we are very fortunate along the Niagara Escarpment to have um, vernal pools, many, many vernal pools. Uh, these uh, vernal means spring, as you know. Uh, vernal pools are temporary water bodies. Uh, usually a vernal pool will dry up the same year. So it, it'll be hydrated at this time of year, might dry up in May, might dry up in June, July, August. If it's a particularly deep vernal pool and uh, there's uh, adequate rain over the course of the summer, a vernal pool may stay hydrated for an entire year, perhaps dry up another year. So the defining characteristic is that it eventually dries up, usually in the same, uh, same year. Uh, the reason I mentioned, mentioned vernal pools is that they're incredibly important environments. They, uh, because of their lack of fish, obviously fish can't live in a, uh, a body of water that dries up. Uh, they host a variety of interesting invertebrate and vertebrate life. Uh, the species that depend utterly in vernal pools are called vernal pool obligate species. And uh, one of the uh, defining invertebrates uh, 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 in this uh, obligate species group is the fairy shrimp. Uh, I encourage you, if you've never seen fairy shrimp, to try to find a vernal pool anytime in April uh, and look for these beautiful little crustaceans. They swim on their back. Uh, they, are, they sometimes fill vernal pools in the tens of thousands. It seems to vary from year to year. They need vernal pools. They're, they're fish food, basically. They can't survive with, uh, in the presence of fish. Wood frogs are vernal pool obligate species. So um, they need uh, that uh, um, uh, environment the, the, uh, the pools eventually drying. Uh, most texts will call the Ambostoma salamanders vernal pool obligate species, not quite accurate. And uh, I'll explain that in a moment. So the habitat needs. Uh, vernal pools are fishless, but more broadly, um, permanent ponds that do not support fish also support Ambostoma salamander populations. The best pond that I go to in terms of numbers every spring is a permanent pond. Uh, thankfully, over the decades that I've known this pond, nobody has seen fit to release the goldfish into it. It's on the Niagara Escarpment. I hope that that would never happen, uh, but it is a spectacular place for spotted salamander breeding and Jefferson salamanders as well. Um, there's a lake in Agonquin Park called Bat Lake, which is so heavily acidic. And we usually think of uh, acidic bodies of water as detrimental to uh, vertebrate life and, and other forms of life. Um, it uh, can't support fish, but it does support thousands and thousands of spotted salamanders uh, that are kept track of by the Agonquin uh, Park Research Station up there. Uh, so uh, it would be more appropriate to call uh, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, uh, fishless, fishless, fishless pond obligate species. Uh, the other habitat element, of course, that they need is, is forest. So you can have a magnificent vernal pond, uh, but if it's out in the middle of a field or in a, an urban environment, you're not going to have uh, Ambostoma salamanders. Uh, likewise, you can have a beautiful tract of forest, but if you don't have a vernal pool in that beautiful tract of forest, you won't have the uh, Ambostoma salamanders either. I could talk uh, a little bit about the potential that uh, we have to install vernal pools. This has been done many, many times. Uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, there's a gentleman down there who is dedicated to the establishment of vernal ponds where vernal pools uh, that do not exist. Uh, I've broached this idea with Credit Valley Conservation uh, in my area. Uh, it's just in the very preliminary consideration stages, but uh, that is one way that we can really enhance uh, a woodland environment that does not have a vernal pool. 
We're blessed again with the presence of the Niagara Escarpment in the Hamilton area and through uh, um, my area of, of Halton, uh, lots and lots of rural pools, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but once you get down to the lowland areas, uh, not very many at all. So the spotted salamander, um, obviously appropriately named. And uh, the uh, spotting patterns are variable. Uh, usually two rows down the back, uh, but the, the abundance of those spots is quite uh, variable indeed. In fact, you can find spotted salamanders that are not spotted at all. This one does have one or two or three spots. Um, most of them, though, are adorned with these, uh, these spots. I'm just going to grab my water here. Uh, as you can see in the uh, slide, the spotting patterns are absolutely unique. And I find this quite fascinating. So uh, you can imagine the, uh, the potential that this has for population studies uh, or longevity studies, uh, photographing uh, even the heads of, of spotted salamanders and then comparing those. Um, uh, images from year to year to year to year. I've just done this casually over the last couple of years. I plan to keep it going, maybe take uh, 50, 60, 70 images of spotted salamanders in the springtime. And maybe eventually uh, I'll be able to work with somebody uh, to uh, develop a database and, and uh, keep track of them. I think they're doing this in Algonquin Park, the Algonquin Park Research Station people. Um, keeping track of individual salamanders uh, in this method. So the uh, comparison between uh, male and female uh, spotted salamanders is quite uh, obvious once you get, get to know the beasts. Uh, the males have an enlarged uh, cloaca. So the cloaca is the dual excretory a reproductive uh, area of the, the salamander. Uh, it's where the vent is uh, at the base of the uh, tail. Females uh, can be identified uh, by the lack of distended cloaca and also the fact that they're uh, uh, distended with eggs as they make their way towards the uh, ponds in the spring. Uh, you've already seen a, a video about the uh, it's, uh, spotted salamanders breeding. Um, it is magical. I, I never grow weary of this. I've watched this now for 30 plus years. And uh, you can bet the first reasonably warm night and in a couple of weeks, I'll be out there again uh, to witness this, uh, this spectacle. There's the spotted salamander without any spots at all. Uh, it's interesting that when they're engaged in their uh, breeding activity, they come up to the surface to get breaths of air rather regularly. So there'll be quite, an quite a bit of uh, activity happening at the, uh, the very surface of the pond as the salamanders uh, rise to, uh, to get a breath of air. However, you can return to the same pond the next morning and not see a salamander at all and not see them ever rise for air so that they're still in the pond. They're buried in amongst the detritus at the bottom of the pond, waiting for darkness to fall. They're almost exclusively nocturnal, not, not, ex not completely exclusively nocturnal, but um, so there they might be thousands in the pond, but you won't see them during the day. They'll stay hidden and presumably they don't have the energetic requirements uh, that would require them to come to the surface to uh, get a breath of air during the day. So the, the ponds in spring, whether they be vernal ponds or uh, permanent ponds are absolute hubs of amphibian activity. And one of the uh, creatures that shares vernal pools with uh, spotted salamanders are the wood frogs. Uh, I came across this uh, particular scene last year at a vernal pool at uh, Scottsdale Farm north of Georgetown. 
and uh, you can perceive the tail of a spotted salamander in that mix of uh, male wood frogs. So the, the male wood frogs, uh, like all male amphibians in the springtime, are bent on reproduction. And they will, uh, they readily mistake other animals for females of their species. And you can't really blame the wood frogs. Consider that they only live for, for perhaps three years. And consider that their breeding period in the spring might be as short as three weeks. So there's a tremendous urgency on the part of wood frogs when they arrive at a pond to get the job done. And uh, in, regrettably in this case, that meant engulfing a poor spotted salamander that probably rose to get a breath of air and then was intercepted by uh, the wood frogs that you see there. I was in that pond for close to an hour and they didn't let up. The salamander was still in the embrace of the wood frogs when I, uh, when I left. Um, Pickerel frogs will do the same thing. And they cling. I don't know if you've ever had a, when I was a little boy, um, I, <coughs> toads, I would put a toad on my wrist. And I had, not, I had absolutely no idea what sex was when I was a little boy. Uh, and I would walk around with the toad attached to my wrist, like wearing a wristwatch. And you know, I was very, very happy indeed. Um, they can cling very, very tightly. So this poor woe-begotten spotted salamander was taking this pickerel frog for a ride, but uh, I could not shake the pickerel frog from its back. Uh, spermatophores were mentioned uh, earlier. And these are all spermatophores. Uh, spotted salamanders, uh, males will deposit those and they are extremely visible. So if you uh, visit a vernal pool or a permanent fishless pond during the day uh, in early April, and you see these spermatophores on the bottom of the pond during the day, and they will last at least 24 hours, then you know you found a pond that has spotted salamander breeding activity in it. And uh, you could come back, of course, uh, in the evening to see the activity. Um, I'm puzzled by a lot of things uh, when, when I talk about salamanders or think about salamanders. This is an area that really begs for uh, close investigation by biologists, scientists. There's so much to be found out about uh, uh, salamanders. Uh, I puzzle over the fact that um, I've watched Jefferson salamanders for decades as well. I've never seen a Jefferson salamander spermatophore. Uh, perhaps they're uh, transparent. Uh, I don't know, but uh, getting back to the spotted salamanders, uh, they're very, very noticeable. So after the female takes uh, the sperm into her cloaca, into her vent, uh, she then lays her eggs. And they lay eggs in exactly the same fashion that the males deposit their spermatophores. They find a support uh, and cling to it with their back legs. The support is usually a stick, as you can see here, sometimes a leaf or some other uh, debris at the bottom of the pond. And then they gradually extrude the eggs out of their cloaca. And there's spotted salamander eggs. Uh, this would be the production of um, uh, several spotted salamander uh, females. Uh, this is the, the typical form of the eggs. Uh, once you get to know them, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a primer on egg identification uh, later on, but uh, spotted salamander eggs have a very noticeable membrane surrounding each of the embryo. Uh, so that is one of the ways that you can distinguish them from Jefferson salamander eggs and, and wood frog eggs, for example. There's always in a population or almost always opaque egg masses. Sometimes there can be more, sometimes there's less. Uh, this is another 
puzzle associated with uh, salamanders. Uh, there's uh, been some speculation that the uh, salamanders that develop in the opaque egg masses are better suited to some uh, pond conditions than the, the uh, salamanders that develop in these regular egg masses. So um, this was laid, every, uh, every egg mass that uh, was produced by this particular female was opaque, and this would be another female uh, here. Um, they don't produce opaque eggs, and then the regular, uh, uh, regular form of eggs uh, from one single female. Uh, so it's really poorly understood, but it might have something to do with hedging the bets uh, of uh, spotted salamanders in a particular location. If this pond is better suited to the salamanders that emerge from the opaque egg mass, then they will thrive and the other ones won't do as well. But uh, that's something that needs to be further investigated. Uh, so after the eggs are laid, they're, they're pretty well protected. There's uh, the gelatinous uh, package that they're uh, present in, but uh, caddisfly larvae uh, are quite substantial predators from what I read of um, spotted salamander eggs and certainly the eggs of other amphibians as well. Uh, I could do a whole presentation about caddisfly larvae. These are spectacular little beasts. Every species uses different materials to make its case. So there's a larval caddisfly within this case. And uh, as I say, there's just lots and lots of different species. Some of them will use um, uh, little snail shells to build their case. Others will use sticks. And uh, they're just remarkable uh, little uh, invertebrates. So they will feed uh, on uh, salamander eggs. So too will these uh, large leeches. Uh, this is a medicinal leech and uh, one of the ponds that they go to has quite a large population of these uh, beautiful leeches. Uh, they range up to about uh, five inches in length. Um, glorious animals uh, in their own right. So these are spotted salamander. Uh, uh, or embryos that are just about to hatch, um, just about ready to uh, burst through the uh, gelatinous uh, package that they're in. And you'll notice the, uh, the green algae. This is uh, yet another uh, puzzle that uh, um, scientists are currently looking at. They've known for a long time, the biologists have, that um, there's a relationship between algae and spotted salamanders. Uh, they've known that for decades, and uh, uh, but they've recently discovered that that particular algae lives nowhere else. It is absolutely dedicated to spotted salamanders. Take the spotted salamanders away, the algae disappears. So uh, there's two ways that the algae, uh, um, two modes of, of living uh, with this particular algae it will fill the, uh, the spaces around the embryo and um, through photosynthesis, it transfers uh, sugars and oxygen to the developing embryo. The developing embryo uh, in turn will, uh, through its waste products, feed the algae. So nitrogen, phosphorus, that sort of thing. So a nice symbiotic relationship going there. But uh, astonishingly, and it's, Pity that it's cut off down below here. Uh, there's a, um, a biologist out at Dalhousie University in uh, Nova Scotia discovered that um, not only does the algae live outside of the, uh, the embryo itself, it penetrates the embryo. It lives inside the little developing salamanders. And not only that, it will stay inside the salamanders through the course of their life. Um, and uh, this is still uh, in the early stages of study, but uh, there's some evidence that 
when the al when the uh, algae uh, penetrates the um, uh, the developing salamander, it confers a little bit of uh, uh, immunity protection to the salamander. The salamander reacts to the algae, builds up its immunity. Uh, it, whatever the case, apparently it serves the salamander well. Now it's not such a good situation for the algae to end up inside the salamander because of course it has trouble photosynthesizing. It can do a little bit of that, uh, you know, when the salamander is uh, still small, but um, the, uh, uh, as, as I say, this, the um, algae will stay within the salamander throughout the lifetime of the salamander. And every time that the, uh, the that this is in both males and females, and then when they reproduce in the springtime, the uh, algae will come out as cysts already embedded in the egg mass and ready to repeat the cycle. The benefit for the algae, uh, at least the uh, supposed benefit for the algae is that they have their bespoke uh, habitat. Their bespoke habitat is spotted salamanders. They can't live anywhere else, but once they've got that relationship going with the spotted salamander, they're guaranteed to um, maintain their presence on planet Earth for as long as spotted salamanders are around. So uh, it, I encourage you with some of the things that I'm saying, some of the puzzles that I'm uh, uh, talking about tonight, if you're interested, dive into it yourself because um, I'm probably missing some of the salient features of, uh, of this relationship, for example, but uh, it is quite fascinating. The larval ambistomas look like this. So they're, uh, they're sit and wait predators. Uh, they have rather large mouths. Uh, they're not going to be actively pursuing uh, little invertebrates uh, through the pond. They're not fast enough, but they uh, will sit and wait. And anything that swims in front of them, like a fairy shrimp, for example, uh, they'll open their wide mouth and, and inhale it, basically. Uh, the, they're, they all have substantial gills. Uh, consider that they're living in a very still pond environment. Uh, oxygen levels are not uh, particularly high. So uh, that's why they have the prominent gills. A metamorph, this was uh, September a couple of uh, years ago, uh, looks like this. So this is a um, newly metamorphosized uh, spotted salamander. You can still see a vestige of gill on the side of the head. Uh, it takes them a while for the uh, yellow spots to congeal. You can see that there's yellow flecking all along the body. Um, I don't know how long it takes. Maybe by the time the next spring rolls around, it will look more like your typical spotted salamander. A uh, little bit of an anecdotal story here, and I don't know if I've got it right, but uh, this, is, this is what I make of this. Uh, Burying beetle. Uh, Burying beetles have a really interesting relationship with mites. And you may be able to perceive the mites on the salamander, mites on the burying beetle. The, uh, the mites uh, use the burying beetle as a vehicle to get to carcasses of small animals. So the burying beetle will find a carcass of a small animal, a mouse, for example. The mites, this is how the story goes. I haven't observed it myself. The mites jump off the burying beetle they go into the, uh, um, into the mouse carcass and they feed on fly larva. So the flies find the, the mice very quickly, of course, they lay their eggs, larvae start to develop, the mites feed on them. So there's a symbiotic relationship going, along, going on be between the burying beetle and the mites. Um, the mites will feed on the fly larva, the burying beetle will lay her eggs, on the mouse and the, uh, her progeny will have less competition because of the mites that she carries around. Now, the next part of my story is pure conjecture. You can think that I'm crazy or not, that's fine. Um, there's mites in the spotted salamanders. Mites don't use spotted salamanders to travel 
to a carcass. The salamander's not going to go to a, uh, um, a dead animal. It's going to find its way to a pond to breed. Uh, so what I think happened here is that the spotted salamander encountered the, a bur burrowing beetle on the way to the pond, ate the burrowing beetle, and the, uh, the mites, not wanting to be consumed along with their host, uh, jumped onto the salamander. What became of them after that is anybody's guess. Uh, leeches love salamanders and almost uh, always they adhere to uh, the spot where the arms or the legs join the abdomen. I have no idea why that's the case. Maybe the uh, skin of the salamander is a little uh, thinner uh, in those areas, uh, but you can find many, many salamanders uh, with uh, leeches at this time of year. Do the leeches know enough to drop off? when the salamander leaves the pond and, and heads back in the forest uh, to go underground, I don't know. Uh, predation, of course, can be a uh, concern. Uh, spotted salamanders are toxic, uh, not extremely toxic, but uh, uh, the spots, the, the vivid spots probably advertise the fact that they, they do have toxins on their skin. Uh, and apparently the tails uh, have great concentrations of toxins. So on a number of times uh, I've uh, come across simply the tails of the spotted salamander. So what I think is happening here is that a predator, a fox, a raccoon, some sort of nocturnal mammalian predator has eaten the body of the salamander, uh, but has left the extremely toxic tail behind. Spotted salamanders, unlike some salamanders, can't just um, autonomize their tail, drop their tail. Um, I'll get to uh, that a little bit in a little bit as well. Uh, snakes have um, seem to have an immunity to a salamander toxin, certainly to toad toxin as well, probably everybody in this room at one time or another has seen a garter snake swallowing a toad. Uh, so they are uh, very definitely a salamander predator. This is one of the reasons that the salamanders come out after dark to avoid being consumed by snakes and, and certainly uh, uh, predators like birds as well. Um, an anecdote regarding a garter snake came to me from Professor Bogart at the University of Guelph, and I'll talk more about him in a moment. Uh, one, of his, uh, one of his students was tracking Jefferson salamanders uh, in Halton region. Uh, they had put little pit tags in, in several Jefferson salamanders, and she found that one was moving very, very quickly. It was a very fast Jefferson salamander. So she, uh, she tracked it down and found, instead of a salamander, a garter snake, took the garter snake back to the lab at the University of Guelph, and um, shortly thereafter, recovered her pit tag. So the uh, the garter snake had dined on the uh, on one of her uh, uh, study subjects. Uh, fascinating study came out of Algonquin Park just a few years ago. Um, again, the Algonquin Park Research Station and a gentleman named Patrick uh, Moldawan and uh, his associates discovered that. Uh, a substantial portion of newly metamorphosized spotted salamanders were ended up ending up in pitcher plants. Uh, in fact, they found that almost 20% of the pitcher plants in a particular bog had these, uh, these poor salamanders um, uh, in, in the pitchers. So in that particular area, uh, this uh, appears to be a significant cause of mortality for the young uh, spotted salamanders. These are the only images that are not mine in the presentation today. And uh, I took them from the uh, Algonquin Park Research uh, Station website. And you can see uh, salamanders within individual pictures, some of them alive, some of them dead. Uh, Jefferson salamanders, spotted salamanders are almost identical in length. Uh, they have almost identical breeding times. Jefferson salamanders start to come to the ponds perhaps a little bit before 
a little earlier than the uh, spotted salamanders. If you get a spotted salamander that doesn't have spots, it can be difficult to distinguish uh, between the two of them. Um, hard to see from these pictures, but uh, the Jefferson salamanders are generally a more slender beast. Uh, spotted salamanders a little more robust. Uh, the, the head of the spotted salamander is broader. Um, the tail, this is a good marker. The tail on the Jefferson salamander is it's more laterally compressed. Um, so probably uh, aids them in swimming a little bit better than the spotted salamander tails do uh, once they get to the ponds. So these are, these look like classic Jefferson salamanders here. Another one here, a young Jefferson salamander right here. This is a classic blue spotted salamander. Now the blue spotted salamanders are about the length of my pinky. They're quite small. The Jefferson salamanders about the length of my hand. Uh, but we get into a real mess. And uh, it, a few of you in the audience are probably aware of this mess. It's the, uh, the unisexual conundrum. And uh, this creature here is probably a unisexual. Um, and we're going to go to this slide and, and you can uh, take a moment to uh, fall asleep if you'd rather not uh, look at my verbiage here, that's fine. But the unisexual complex is really fascinating and just stunningly complex and confusing. So all um, the unisexuals, according to people in the know, look almost identical to either blue spotted salamanders or Jefferson salamanders. They are all female. That's why they're called unisexuals. So they're completely female. They come to the ponds in the spring along with uh, the um, pure blooded Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders. And they require contact with a blue spotted male or a Jefferson male for their uh, eggs to develop properly. But they don't incorporate any, all, it, this happens almost always, they never incorporate uh, any of the, um, the blue spotted male or the Jefferson spotted male genetics. They just need a male to prompt their own cloning of themselves, basically. So Jim Bogart, getting back to, uh, to him, he's uh, now Professor Emeritus at the University of Guelph, he refers to them as sexual parasites because they take from the male, but they don't give anything back. They, they do not uh, incorporate any of his lineage in their eggs. It's a fascinating situation. So Jim uh, monitors a pond out in the Guelph area, and he projects, he extrapolates that eventually there'll be no Jefferson salamanders, either the unisexuals or the full-blooded salamanders there at all, because it's now primarily unisexual females. And he projects that they're going to, they, they won't be able to stimulate their own egg development. They'll eventually die out. Um, however, having said that, we're not at imminent risk of losing Jefferson salamanders, this situation has been going on for millions of years. Um, and to further complicate and further confuse you, uh, in the United States in particular, there's a total of five different salamander species that can contribute their genes to these unisexuals. So you can get a unisexual that looks like a Jefferson salamander that might have tiger salamander, smallmouth salamander, and blue spotted salamander genes uh, incorporated within its genetic structure. So it gets just incredibly complex. You can't call them species. They're all over the map. There's different combinations. And uh, um, uh, I'll stop talking about it very soon because uh, uh, I still get confused. I've, I've talked to Jim Bogart about this, and I, I'm still confused. But um, one of the puzzles that uh, emerges from this is that the wire spotted salamanders not part, part of the complex. 
Spotted salamanders appear to be very closely related to tiger salamanders, for example, uh, and yet they've never, their genetics have never been found in these unisexuals. I better move on. Uh, so these can be either the unisexuals or full-blooded uh, Jefferson salamander uh, females laying their eggs. Their eggs are considerably different than uh, spotted salamander eggs. The, uh, they're always rather linear, and you get a good example of that here, and I'll show you other images as well. Um, and they don't generally contain as many eggs as a clump of spotted salamander uh, eggs uh, do. And they don't have the prominent membrane that is a feature of the uh, spotted salamander uh, embryos. So these are uh, all Jefferson salamander eggs and, and you can uh, appreciate the linearity of their uh, placement along uh, structures. So if you see this sort of thing in a uh, vernal pool and your wanderings this spring, you can almost be assured that it's either uh, Jefferson salamanders or uh, the unisexuals, uh, uh, the product of, of them. And we'll see if we can get a... Uh, Back. Okay, I'm hoping that this will work now. So I'll skip this uh, video, regrettably since I don't uh, seem to be able to get it working. This is a magnificent vernal pool in uh, North Halton, in the Speyside area. Uh, contains hundreds, if not thousands of Jefferson salamanders, spotted salamanders in the springtime. And I was going to take you on a dive underneath the surface to show you the extent of the Jefferson salamander eggs in this pond. They're virtually everywhere on every single support uh, you can see the uh, red osier dogwood by the side here. So, you know, in drier times, they'll be above the surface of the water. But at this time of year, uh, their stems extend underneath the water. And that's where many of the um, egg masses will be laid. Uh, these are Jefferson salamander uh, eggs again. Notice the linear fashion of their uh, placement on the supports. Uh, you'll notice that uh, many of them appear to be moldy, and in fact, they are moldy. And uh, the speculation here is that the um, uh, unisexual eggs are more susceptible to mortality than uh, the, uh, the eggs that are the product of a pure blood Jefferson male and female getting together. Uh, they're also infused, and I've noticed this many, many times, also infused with uh, algae. So here's yet another salamander puzzle. Uh, could Jefferson salamanders also have a symbiotic relationship with algae? I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's the case. Uh, so the eggs are laid, and if they're laid at this time of year or a you know, week or two for now, from now, they might even be laid underneath the ice. So these salamanders only need a, a fringe of open water at the edge of the pond to slip under and uh, begin their, uh, their breeding activity. The eggs are laid. And then if that ice melts and the water level goes down, you can find this situation. I've encountered this many, many times where the eggs are left high and dry. Um, it just seems to be one of the hazards of uh, uh, laying eggs in such a, a, a precarious environment, really. Um, these eggs, by the way, are still viable. So in a case, in a situation like this, um, I'll snip the, uh, uh, the, the branches that they're on and immerse the, the eggs, um, allowing them to uh, survive. But it, it's entirely a natural uh, mortality event. Uh, so the egg primer that I 
I referenced earlier, wood frog eggs, they're always at the surface of the water. Uh, wood frogs lay communally. So this would be the product of uh, many wood frog females. And you can see here's a wood frog mass right here. They're much more densely packed. The embryos are much more densely packed than the uh, spotted salamander uh, eggs are that you can see right here. Uh, pickerel frog, pickerel frogs were overlap with uh, uh, salamanders uh, towards the end of the salamander season. So getting into mid April, and you can see the density of their egg masses. And unlike the wood frog egg masses, pickerel frog egg masses are usually attached to an underwater support like the branch that you see here. Jefferson salamander eggs you're already acquainted with. And then over here, we have the opaque uh, spotted salamander eggs, Jefferson salamander eggs, and I think there's some typical spotted salamander eggs in there as well. So after a while, uh, looking in, in vernal pools and, and other uh, ponds, uh, you can begin to figure out uh, what the egg masses are. We're getting towards the end and uh, just do a, a brief overview of a few other salamanders that we have in the area and hoping that this will work. The male is on top. So this is typical mating behavior of the red spotted newt. Uh, unlike the spotted salamanders, spotted salamanders really don't, they practice safe sex. They don't uh, uh, generally touch each other, but uh, the male red spotted newt clings to the neck of the female. It uh, looks kind of brutal, but this is how they do it. And he holds on really tightly and this can go on for hours. But I've seen this go on at a pond and then come back uh, three, four hours later and uh, it, it's still happening. He's wafting his pheromones from his vent uh, towards the, the nose of the female. And according to the literature, this will uh, stimulate the female to uh, consider uh, taking his sperm and laying uh, her eggs. Very common uh, animals uh, in vernal pools, as well as uh, permanent bodies of water. They don't seem to be uh, as bothered by fish as other uh, salamanders are. And you can hear, hear the odd spring peeper in the background. So we'll move on from there and consider the immature form of uh, the red spotted newt. And my guess is that if you've spent any time hiking along the escarpment, you've encountered these glorious creatures, the red Fs. So this is, uh, these are not uh, sexually mature. Uh, the literature suggests that they're on uh, land for two or three years before they uh, basically go through a metamorphosis. They turn green, grow a larger tail, and go into the water uh, for the balance of their, uh, their existence. Uh, so an interesting, uh, interesting partition of resources here. The... Uh, the adults will avail themselves of all of the resources in a pond. The uh, immatures, the red Fs, will wander the forest floor, uh, you know, eating the invertebrates that they find in, in that environment. So they're basically splitting the, uh, the food sources between the two. Um, a fascinating creature by any right. It is uh, toxic. Um, and that probably doesn't come as a surprise to you because uh, they advertise their toxicity with their color. Think monarch butterfly. Anytime you have a very bright, small creature, whether it be invertebrate or vertebrate, chances are very good that that creature is toxic. So these uh, uh, red Fs, our red Fs, are apparently toxic enough to kill something like a shrew, a mouse, um, a mole, small mammals that uh, might otherwise eat them or small animals that would eventually learn not to touch the red F. Uh, however, the Fs or the, uh, uh, the newts on the West Coast, 
from California through to we're yeah, we're getting there. We're almost there. On the West Coast from California up to, to British Columbia, they can kill people. And um, there's a couple of stories, uh, perhaps apocryphal, but one story is of a, a group of guys who went camping. Uh, they put some uh, water on the, uh, the boil uh, to get a cup of coffee in the evening. Uh, unknown to them was the fact that a, uh, a Western newt had crawled into the coffee pot and it killed them. Uh, killed three or four of them, at least that's the story that you can find in the web. And of course, everything you find in the web is, uh, is true, right? <laughs> um, Redback salamanders, the most common species that we have. They do not need to uh, breed in ponds. Uh, they breed in terrestrial. Uh, uh, they're totally terrestrial. Uh, they are lungless. So despite the fact that they do not have to return to the water to breed, they must always be in contact with moisture. That's how they respire. They respire through the skin and that respiration is facilitated by moisture. Uh, a young, so the, the eggs are laid uh, perhaps in a cavity in a rotting log or underneath a, a stone. Um, they readily lose their tail when attacked like many lizards and many other salamanders. Uh, they come in lead-backed form as well. These are usually a minority in any population, uh, perhaps uh, in my area of North Halton, about 5%. Um, Red-backed salamanders climb. So about five, six years ago, I was wandering the woods uh, in, in uh, late summer, early fall, and I discovered uh, red-backed salamanders uh, we're out on mass. This is after a rainstorm during the day, and most of them were off the ground, and this fascinated me. And I've done this with my um, herptile buddies, if you will, for the last five years in the fall, and uh, we're always excited to find scores of these creatures on, again, on an appropriate day. Um, I, I love this because you don't have to disturb them by flipping a log or flipping a, a rock. They're out there doing their thing. Why did it, oh, this, this one uh, was 80 centimeters up the sheer trunk of a tree. Why do they climb? A uh, few possibilities. Uh, they breed in the fall, so maybe it assists pheromone dispersal. So they get themselves up over the uh, forest floor. Uh, there's more air current. Uh, and more communication via pheromones, um, maybe foraging, although I question that uh, hypothesis because you'd think that there'd be all sorts of little um, uh, invertebrates right down in the leaf litter. Uh, and maybe it's this cause. There's a, that this was, I, I did not place this by the way. The Fs will climb as well, not as much as the, uh, Redback salamanders. So here's another possible cause. It might be all wet, but I'll throw this at you. The spotted salamanders return to the surface in the fall of the year, not in the numbers that they did in the, were in the spring, but they're on the prowl, uh, late September, early October. They are ravenous predators. There's a possibility uh, that the redback salamanders climb to avoid being eaten by the um, <laughs> Spotted salamanders. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving along really quickly here because I got the wave just a moment ago. Um, this is a stream in Halton. And a mud puppy. So an incredibly cryptic creature uh, because they're nocturnal and they're also exclusively aquatic. Uh, they have these fleshy gills over the course of their life. They are the biggest salamander by far that we have. Uh, you know, a, to about 30 centimeters long and maybe a little bit longer than that and particularly robust specimens. They're uh, predators. Uh, they are active right through the year, incredibly hardy. They range up to Lake Winnipeg and that sort of thing. And only a, a couple of years ago uh, did I become acquainted with these amazing creatures uh, for the first time. Second last slide, uh, Lou. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to leave you with this, friend Calvin. So Calvin is, uh, if you want to get technical, salamander C among a group of piebald or leucistic salamanders that I'm acquainted with at a, a pond that I go to. So I've found over the last five, six, seven years, six of them, A, B, C, D, E, F. And I thought because uh, Calvin has reappeared so reliably, I'd, I'd uh, give him uh, a proper name. Um, he is a male. So I am being correct when I, I say he, he gets together with the other males, deposits his spermatophores. Calvin was first found uh, by Charlotte Cox of Credit Valley Conservation, 2010. I encountered him seven years later, uh, 2017. John Clayton uh, from CBC found him in 2019. I was out with a gentleman named Ryan Wolf, who is uh, an amazing herp guy. Some of you probably know Ryan. I think he comes from Hamilton. And uh, he, uh, he, he's been studying uh, Blue Racers, Peely Island for many years. Um, so he and I went out March 29, 2020, found him. Uh, Calvin was still in the pond uh, on April 17th. That gives you, that's about the stretch right there, about three weeks. Um, 2021, 2022, and I dearly hope that I find or I meet Calvin again this year. I'll be looking for him. I did find a leucistic larval salamander. So leucism lucis or um, piebald uh, uh, creatures are animals that um, have a defect in some of their epidermal uh, cells, not allowing melanin and some other colors to be expressed. Notice that they have dark eyes. So there, there's not any albinism uh, associated with this uh, condition. Um, absolutely stunned that Calvin appears in precisely the same spot, at least all of these years, precisely the same spot in the pond. So th this pond is big, you know, it's, it's over an acre in size. I call it Calvin's office and Calvin's office is about the size of the carpet up here at the front. He doesn't, it doesn't seem to diverge from that area at all. So this begs the question, how on earth do they find their way to precisely the same spot that they were last year? They might've walked 500 meters, maybe more, maybe a kilometer to get back to the pond. It, we understand a little bit about how uh, animals orient themselves like salmon, right? They return to their natal streams by um, using their olfactory sense to uh, follow the chemical uh, cues. Um, so I have, you know, that helps me understand how this, the salamanders get to the, the pond, but to the very specific part of the pond, I, I, I just find that absolutely mind blowing. Uh, so that, of course, is where I'll be looking for Calvin uh, this coming spring. So that's about it. Uh, cut off down below. I'm doing a pond workshop, a virtual pond workshop for the University of Guelph Arboretum, uh, Thursday, April 20th. Uh, if you tap into that, it's, sorry, it's uh, $10. Um, I'll be showing some of the slides that you've uh, seen tonight along with some others. And then I have a, um, uh, a pond workshop in person on April 22nd. It's cut off here at the University of Guelph Arboretum. That one is $55. If you spend $55, you also get the $10 uh, 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 um, virtual session included in that. So just to let anybody know who might be interested in you know, let other people know if you like. Uh, and this is my book, uh, Nature Where We Live. I do have a few copies uh, with me tonight. And that's not my slide. Thank you very much. For